Hey, Grace Hill family. Hope all of you are doing well. Excited to jump back into our Romans Bible study tonight. Uh, we took a two-week break as we were doing our Holy Week uh, devotional together over the last two Sundays. And now it's time to jump back into the book of Romans. We're going to be finishing up chapter 12 uh, today. And uh, excited to do this, and in, in the reason is because um, Romans 12 is a chapter that I've been studying a lot lately, meditating on a lot, actually so much so that next Sunday, May 1st, I'm actually going to start, because we're done with the Gospel of Luke, uh, I'm going to start a sermon series, four-part sermon series on Romans chapter 12, and so I really do want all of us as a church to be kind of steeped into this chapter and really um, inviting the Spirit to uh, point out uh, where this chapter challenges us and um, for it to really instruct us. If you remember, two, three weeks ago now when we last were in Romans 12, we studied uh, verses 1, I believe, to 8 together. Um, I can't exactly remember where we're going to start. I think we're starting in chapter 9 today. Let me check that for us. Yeah, we did 1 to 8 last time. And so uh, if you remember, let me just kind of recap it again because it's been a few weeks. Um, but as I mentioned last time, all of Paul's letters seem to have a, a standard flow to them. Um, they start with a greeting um, and encouragement um, then Paul goes heavy into theology. There's something in particular he's trying to teach them about God and the gospel and who Jesus is. So it gets very theological. And then at the end of his letters, he always shifts over and he gets very practical um, and he gets into application. And so what he's trying to do is, is show you how the theology that he just unpacked for you um, will actually impact the way that you live your life. And so Paul's always doing that. And Romans 12 really marks the start of that in the book of Romans. Obviously, Romans is a very theological letter. And in Romans 12 and then in 13, 14, 15, he gets very practical about how everything he just talked about in the previous chapters really applies to your everyday life. Life And so today in the verses that we're going to read, verses 9 uh, all the way down through 21, um, Paul's very practical. It's almost like Proverbs where he's just he's just tossing out some instructions and commands. You know, he's like, man, make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're doing this. Um, and so we're going to kind of walk through all of them. But remember, next Sunday, May 1st, I'm going to start a sermon series on this where we're really for four weeks going to dig into this as a church. So hopefully through this and also our sermon series, we really can can um, grasp what Romans chapter 12 is trying to teach us. Um, let me remind all of us by reading it um, where Paul begins in this chapter. And, and here's what I want to do. I want to read the first few verses. We studied them at our last Bible study. I want to re read the first few verses, remind us um, of what Paul is saying. Then we'll dig into our verses for today. Um, but the important thing that we're going to need to do today is um, keep in mind the gospel context that undergirds all of the commands that Paul is about to give us, all right? And that's the one thing I want to make sure that we do in this Bible study is that we kind of make sure that the gospel context is always being highlighted because it gives us the why behind these commands and it also gives us the how behind these commands. Let's be reminded where Paul starts, okay? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is where he starts the chapter. We studied this last time, but this has a reminder. Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore. So real quick, Paul is saying, in light of chapters 1 to 11, in light of everything that I just discussed and taught you through the previous uh, portions of my letter, um, here's now my command my instruction to you. So I, pay, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, on the basis of chapters 1 to 11, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living 
sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, we studied this last time, so I'm not going to go super in-depth here, but just as a reminder, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, in light of everything that I just taught you uh, through uh, the earlier parts of my letter, I'm instructing you, I'm commanding you, God is commanding you, he's inviting us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, to, to basically say, okay, God, you have purchased me by the blood of Jesus on the cross. You have saved me. You have rescued me. You have brought me into your family. You have adopted me as a son or a daughter of God. Therefore, I am now going to offer you my entire life. I'm going to offer you my body. I'm going to offer you my life. I'm going to offer you my gifts and my skills and my abilities and my time and my money and everything that I have, I now give to you as a living sacrifice. And so he's saying, hey, we need to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We need to understand what God has done for us and how that changes our life so that we're no longer living our life in the way that the world lives it, but we're living our life in the way that God wants us to live it. And because he's rescued us in Christ, we can trust that the way God wants us to live is good and right and beautiful and for our flourishing and not the opposite. And so with that said, here's the, here's the, the gospel banner that I want to put over everything that we're going to study together uh, today. Let's real quick do a uh, overview of some gospel truths that Paul has taught us in the book of Romans, because these gospel truths will undergird all of the commands that we're going to read about today in Romans chapter 12. So let's just here, so I'm going to do is I'm going to label this our kind of gospel banner. And, and what I mean by that is this, right, uh, stands over everything we're going to learn today. This is the why behind everything we're going to learn today. This is the how behind everything we're going to learn today. So if we start in Romans 1, real quick, I'm just going to do a few of these. Don't worry, I'm not going to recap the whole book. Uh, but in Romans 1, right, one of the things we learn in one twenty two right, is when we sinned against God, when we rejected God as our king, when we said, God, I'd rather live my life my way and not your way, we thought we were wise, but we were really fools. That's what Romans 1 22 says. We thought we were smart. We thought we had outsmarted God, but we are actually fools, right? If you go to chapter three, look at verse 10, one of the things we learn is that there is no one that is good. We have all sinned. We've all sinned against God. We all deserve his judgment and condemnation. There's not one person that's better than the other. One of the things the Apostle Paul does in his theology, the book of Galatians here in Romans, is he evens the playing field. He said every single person is condemned under the law equally, and therefore we need the same amount of God's grace in order to be saved. All right, so those are important things. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, right? It tells us that while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. All right, so Christ comes to us, comes for us while we were sinning, right? We were sinning you gotta fit it in there that's romans 5 8 so what romans 5 8 is teaching us 
is that we weren't the ones that compelled Christ to come. We weren't the ones that cleaned up our life enough and convinced him and impressed him enough to do something that would forgive us of our sins. It's saying while we were still lost and sinning, no one righteous, we were being foolish, all of that, Christ came after us. All right, going to be so important to what we're going to read here in Romans chapter 12. Right. And so uh, Romans chapter six. Right. Uh, What we see here is that um, we have been. Let's see, let's do chapter six, verse. Let's do three to four. Right. Is we are united with Christ. In his death. And resurrection, meaning when Christ went to the cross, we went to the cross and all of our sins were paid for. When Christ rose again from the dead, we rose again from the dead, brand new, righteous in God's sight, which leads us to Romans 8, 1. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Later in chapter 8, we learn that we are adopted into God's family. And we also learned that God is beginning to change us, all right? Um, He's changing our character. He's helping us to live by the Spirit. All right, so I'm going to stop there. I think that's enough. All right, there's so much more in Romans we could go. But I just want you to see this progression real quick in the book of Romans. Paul is telling us that we thought when we were sinning against God that we we were wise, but we were fools, and that no one is good. All of us deserve the condemnation of God, but Christ came for us while we were sinning. We didn't compel him to do that. He went to the cross and rose again so we can be united with him in that death and resurrection, cleansing us of our sin, giving us new life. And because of that, there is no condemnation over us. We've been brought into God's family, and now God is doing a work inside of us, a sanctifying work to change and transform us and who we are and what our character is, okay? This is the gospel banner that I want to kind of set over this entire study, all right? And so let's go to Romans 12, all right? And let's think practically about, okay, God, now that you've done all of these things for me, How do I now present my body as a living sacrifice? How do I represent you and your kingdom in the way that I live my life? And that's what Romans 12 is going to challenge us with today. There's a lot in here. I'm going to move fast through it. And my encouragement to you is to uh, be thinking through which which of these commands and instructions um, are of most challenge to you and the ones that you might need to um, examine yourself and seek help in seeing these being lived out in your life. All right, so there's our gospel banner. Let's dig into the practical part. We'll start in Romans 12, verse 9. Paul says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Now, what's important about this verse is, Paul is giving us a a helpful definition of what genuine love is, all right? And there's other parts of the Bible, 1 John, that teaches us what love is. It's when we're willing to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. But also this idea of genuine versus artificial love. And one of the things that Paul is saying is that love is genuine when we hold fast to what is good and we reject and abhor the things that are evil, Um, that sometimes we may not want to um, uh, hold fast to our faith, hold fast to our beliefs, hold fast to our values, our morals that God has given us because there are people in the world that reject that and they would see it as unloving for us to hold fast to the things that we believe are true and good and right. And one of the things that Paul is teaching us here is that genuine love always holds to the truth. Genuine love always holds fast to what is good and rejects what is evil. Now, this is one of the verses in the Bible that I think gets taken out of context a lot. And I've seen it a lot lately, especially in this social media age. Um, 
Christians, uh, Christian leaders um, really like to go after each other uh, on social media platforms. And um, one of the things that I see is this verse tossed around as kind of a verse that um, provides a justification for treating people poorly uh, because they might um, hold to a, a belief or they might accept something that another person finds to be bad or evil or sinful. And so this verse will be used to say what genuine love is, is to hold so strongly to the truth and to what is good and to abhor so strongly what is evil that you actually have justification to treat the person who who you disagree with um, in harsh and mean ways because you are holding fast to the truth. Now, I do think Paul is saying that Genuine love always holds to what is true, always holds to what is good, and rejects what is evil and sinful. But I think as we're going to see through the rest of chapter 12, what Paul would completely reject is this idea that this verse gives you the license to be mean, to be harsh, to be condemning um, towards people who disagree with you. All right. And I think that we're going to see that uh, in this verse. Let's keep going. Verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So Paul is now getting kind of into the church as we live life with one another. How are we going to treat one another? And he says, love one another with a brotherly affection. So brotherly affection, meaning a, a kind of affection where you're committed to each other. You're family now. Right. And so we don't kick family to the curb. We don't treat family poorly. Right. We band together. We watch out for one another. We care for one another. And so when you see brotherly affection, I want you to see a committed uh, affection. All right. And so genuine love isn't just holding fast to what is good and rejecting what is evil, but it's also a committed type of love where you say, no matter what, we're still going to be together. I'm not going to leave you alone or to reject you. And actually, let's dig into the relationship a little bit more. The command is outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor that in the church, we should be encouraging one another in such a way where we're trying to encourage others more than they are encouraging us. And they are trying to encourage us more than we are trying to encourage them. Um, and so this is kind of giving us a snapshot of a culture of people where they're committed and they are seeking opportunities to care, encourage, and honor one another. It's a group of people where we're always building each other up. Always. And let me ask you, have you ever had a church experience where you go in and you go, man, these people are doing nothing but building one another up. They're going to each other and they're saying things like, man, I, I saw how you encouraged that other person the other day, how you prayed with them, you cared for them. Man, I'm so proud of you, of how you went after someone who was hurting. Man, I saw you with the kids the other day at Grace Hill Kids. You were so good with them. Uh, that Man, you were amazing at that. Or I saw you playing the guitar on stage and you did such a great job. You worshiping in front of this congregation led me to go into worship in this congregation. Uh, maybe it's in community group where you are just outdoing one another and showing honor, seeking to encourage and build up. And it just begs the question, do we have a culture where we tear down more than we build up? Or here's what I think is probably more true. Do we have a culture where we're, we're too timid and afraid to encourage and honor one another so we just don't say anything at all? And so we just kind of stay silent. And Paul is saying, listen, outdo one another in showing honor. Go back to our gospel banner. Christ came after us even when we weren't seeking him. And Paul is saying, go after one another. Be committed to one another. Outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another like Christ has loved you. 
verse 11 and 12. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit. So the last few verses, we were just talking about relationships within the church. Now I think Paul is switching gears. He, he kind of does this a lot in this chapter. And now we're talking about what we do when there's persecution or tribulation or when we're facing hard times. Maybe it's hard times in our personal lives. Maybe it's hard time um, as for, for being a Christian, um, wh- whatever it is. What, what do we do in those moments? And Paul is saying, do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. And essentially what Paul is saying here is trust that God is sovereign. Trust that he has purchased and secured your future. And so therefore you are free to serve the Lord instead of be preoccupied with the hard things that are going on around you. That Jesus has come after you, you belong to him, offer your body as a living sacrifice, and serve the Lord. Because Christ has secured us, there's no reason to be slothful in our zeal. And so he says, rejoice. Rejoice in the hope that you have in Christ, and be patient in tribulation and constant in prayer. I think this is such a good message for us today. Um, I, I feel like we're in a day and age where I see a lot of Christians panicking. I see a lot of Christians panicking over what's happening politically. I see a lot of Christians panicking over what's happening in foreign policy. I see a lot of Christians panicking when it comes to different um, things morally and socially going on in our country. And, and Paul is saying here, whoa, 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 be patient in that stuff. Be prayerful in that stuff. Rejoice in the hope that you have. As a Christian, here's the deal. We have no need to panic because Christ has come after us. He has changed us. He has purchased us. He's adopted us into his family And so we can be a non-anxious presence in a very anxious and stressed out world. Christians don't need to panic over who's president. Christians don't need to panic over the moral decline of our society. We need to be engaged in that. And we need to hold fast to what is good and true and abhor what is evil. But we don't need to panic because Jesus is on the throne. We actually are commanded here. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in all of it. And constant in prayer. Let's keep moving. Verse 13, continue, or sorry, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And so I think in the midst of this, again, it's a little another, we're switching gears a little bit, but it's just another command to continue to serve the Lord, continue to uh, invest in the church. I think this is a command in verse 13 to be invested in your local church that's doing the local work of proclaiming the kingdom of God and the gospel. And so we need to contribute financially and also with our time and gifts and skills into what is going on in the church. And we need to seek to show hospitality. Our call as Christians is to be representatives, ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And so by contributing to the work of the church in that work and also showing hospitality to our neighbors, we are representing God's kingdom. And so this is almost a response to the previous verses. One of the ways I think we show patience in tribulation and we rejoice in hope is through investing in the work of the church and being hospitable to our neighbors that are around us instead of panicking, instead of sheltering in place, instead of getting angry at the world around us for the direction that they're going, but instead push into the church, show hospitality to the neighbors, be patient and prayerful in all of those things. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Um, We are commanded to serve those who are persecuting us, to serve those who think that Christians are annoying, to serve those who don't don't accept 
our morals or our values, but rather we're commanded to bless them and not to curse them. So we, we are not allowed to talk badly about people around us, whether, whether they're rejecting what we believe in the world or whether they're inside our church body. We are told to outdo one another in showing honor and to bless those outside who persecute us, not to curse them. So I just want that to sink into us. We are not allowed as Christians by command of our Lord and Savior. We are not allowed to speak badly about people, period, period. And, and why? I mean, let's go back to our gospel banner. Why is that? Because all of us were outside the kingdom of God at one point. Fools. We thought we were wise. We thought our morals and our values and our beliefs and our worldviews were the best. But Romans 1 22 says, no, you thought you were wise, but you were a fool and there's no one that's good. And the only reason that you are included in the kingdom of God and have been adopted into God's family is because in God's loving mercy and grace, he chose to come after you while you were still sinning. And so in the same way, fam, listen up, we are called to do the same thing. We are called to be a blessing to the people around us, to Go after them to explain the hope that's in them, not to curse them. I mean, where would any of us be, fam? Listen, where would any of us be if Jesus, instead of coming after us, just decided to curse us? Oh, praise God that he is more gracious than that. And he calls his church to be more gracious than that as well. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Why can't we be wise in our own sight? Well, remember Romans 1. At one point, we thought we were wise and we were actually being fools when we rejected God. And so there is a call here in how we love one another in the church and also how we love those outside the church to be very humble, to be very gracious, to be very uh, delightful to be around, um, where we take the feelings of other people seriously and that we join them in their rejoicing and we join them in their weeping. Um, We seek to live in harmony with one another. Um, so what this means is that we work hard to reconcile through conflicts. What this means is that we don't give silent treatments. We don't emotionally punish one another or people on the outside. We don't exaggerate things that happen to make ourselves look good. We don't, uh, talk bad about people. I mean, live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. The church of Jesus Christ is commanded to go after the most vulnerable in our town. The people that everyone thinks don't, does not deserve a blessing or does not deserve a handout. And one of the reasons why Jesus is so passionate about this about us going after the poor and the marginalized and the vulnerable is because he wants us to see that that's who we were and he came after us. Romans 5, that's who we were and he came after us. And so if we ever adopt this attitude of like, well, you know, we don't want the poor to kind of mingle with our congregation that might be uncomfortable. Um, We don't want, uh, uh, we're uncomfortable with, with dealing with a certain segment of the population, Jesus is saying that might be a red flag that you're, you're kind of haughty, that you, you're, you, you see yourself as better than them. And that's anti-gospel. I mean, if we go back to our gospel banner, there's nothing more anti-gospel than a follower of Jesus thinking that they are better than another person. Why? Because no one's good. For a follower of Jesus to believe that they are more deserving of God's grace than anybody else because Romans 5, 8, he came after us while we were sinning. 
And so it's anti-gospel for us to see ourselves as better than any other person, whether it's from a morality perspective, whether it's from a spiritual perspective, uh, an economic perspective, whatever it is. It's just anti-gospel. It goes against everything that our faith is about. And so we are called to live in harmony with all people. So what does it look like then, right, to let love be genuine, to hold fast to what is good, and to abhor what is evil, but at the same time, outdo one another in showing honor, living in harmony with one another, blessing those and not cursing people. It means that, if I can just say it this way, we're not allowed to be mean people as Christians. We can't be mean. Uh, we, we can't be harsh people. Uh, we're, we're just not allowed. It goes against everything that we believe. We are called to be gracious, kind, gentle people who, yes, hold fast to what is good and true. Yes, we are strong in that. But in our demeanor and the way that we treat people, we're always seeking to live in harmony. We're always seeking to bless. We're always seeking to outdo one another in showing honor. Got to keep going. This is the uh, 17 to the end. Oop, a little bit of my uh, text is blocked off there. I'll read it for you. It says this, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. So when we see this in the sight of all, right, that's everybody in the church, everybody outside the church. That's everybody who thinks we're bonkers for what we believe. That's people who live a moral a type of moral lifestyle that we would not be okay with. In the sight of all, we are to give thought to what is honorable, to conduct ourselves in that way. And just because someone's mean or harsh or violent towards us does not mean we are allowed to be mean or harsh or violent towards them. Just because someone is kind of uh, in a political way, you know, tries to dig up dirt on us or lies about us or exaggerates about us doesn't mean we can do the same to them. Never. If possible, verse 18, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. All. So interesting word here, all. It means like all, all people, right? There's no exception here. As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everybody in your house. As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with those in your church. As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with those that you disagree with. Live peaceably with those of a different political party. Live peaceably with those who persecute you and treat you badly. Live peaceably with those who reject what you have to believe. Live peaceably with those who are trying to push our country in a direction you don't want it to go. Live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, repay, says the Lord. And so what God is saying is, listen, here's what I've called you to do, Christian. I've called you to represent my kingdom. I've called you to proclaim what is true and good and beautiful, the word of God. I've called you to live exemplary lives in front of the world. But I've called you to be gentle and caring. I called you to bless people. I've called you to serve people. I've called you to treat people really well and kindly and honorably. Every single person. You're not allowed to be mean. You're not allowed to be snarky. Um, you're not allowed to panic. Trust me. Trust what I am doing. And here's what God says in verses 19. He says, I will make sure there is justice. I will make sure that if people continue to work against my kingdom, that they will face my judgment. That's mine to have, and I will take care of it. And so by you living peaceably with all, showing honor to all, blessing those, you're showing that you trust me in that and that you don't need to take it into your own hands.
Verse 20, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so essentially what Paul is saying at the end there, when he says heap burning coals, he's basically saying, treat people really well. Treat them really well and gently and kindly and honorably. Every single person, the the person who uh, is is you know I don't know a barista at Starbucks or a server at a restaurant who messes up your order and they're slow and they're not paying attention and it doesn't look like they're doing their job well. If they have a Christian, a Christ follower at their table who Christ has come for them when they were still sinning, they should be treated exceptionally well. We should give them the benefit of the doubt. We should assume the best about them. We should make sure that we are a breath of fresh air in their day. There's never, ever, ever a circumstance or a moment where a Christian is allowed to be snarky or mean to that person, ever. Like when there are people in our world who go after us and they persecute us and they speak against us, we treat them well and kindly. If they're hungry, we feed them. If they're thirsty, we give them something to drink. And trust the Lord with it, right? I, I mean, if your neighbor isn't mowing their grass or they're making a lot of noise, I'm not saying you can't go over there and ask them to keep it down, but you're called to treat them really well, to live peaceably, to show honor, to bless, not curse. I, I, like, I, this is a challenge for all of us, ch- church family. Like, It's a challenge for me. Who are the people that we feel like it, we have, the, we have the, the permission, the justification to treat them poorly? Um, I, I look back on moments in my life where I've done that. I, I felt like I had a justified reason to be snarky and mean. And the Lord has always convicted me. No, nope, never, ever, ever, ever are we allowed to do that because we represent the king. We represent the kingdom of God. We represent a God who came after us even when we were being mean and snarky and we were sinning against him and he came after us because that's the gospel banner. And so that concludes Romans 12. There's a lot in there. We're going to dig into this as a church family over the next four Sundays starting May 1st. Um, But I just encourage you to, to read through this and Where is the spirit impressing upon you? Hey, there might be a weakness here. And where have you seen growth and maturity and strength in some of these areas as you have watched the spirit change and sanctify you? But remember, there's a gospel banner over this entire thing. We are called to represent the king, to give our bodies as living sacrifices. And so in all of our interactions inside the church and outside the church, we are called to be gentle and kind and caring, a delight to be around. Family, I love you. So grateful to study the Bible with you. I hope that was helpful. It was a little long, a lot to cover today, Um, but excited to keep digging into this chapter with you. Tune in next Sunday night. We'll, We'll jump into Romans 13, starting in verse 1. Um, very uh, good passage on um, how we should uh, regard the government. And so hope you dig in uh, with us on that. All right. Love you, family. And uh, we'll see you soon.